Among the peoples of Southern Africa, an extraordinary group stands out. They're called the Lemba or the Black Jews. They trace their origins back not to ancestors on this continent, but rather to a people who lived in the land of Israel thousands of years ago. But what makes them even more remarkable is their assertion that when they came into Africa, they also brought with them possibly the most sought after object in human history, the fabled Ark of the Covenant. The Ark that stood in the temple in Jerusalem and which vanished without a trace two and a half millennia ago. If you touch it, you die instantly. Nobody but the priest was allowed to touch it. If they did, they were dead. Perhaps they have the Ark of the Covenant. It belongs to us. Ever since he was a young boy, Joe Rowlinger believed he was different. He heard that around the fires where he grew up in the Limpopo province of South Africa. He was taught that he was a Lemba. The Lemba people in Southern Africa in particular are connected to the Jewish people in Israel. And therefore, we have got Jewish blood as uh, the Southern African Lembas. Today, Joe Rowlinger is a judge in the Pretoria High Court. The Lemba live among other black groups like the Venda and speak their languages. But they maintain their origins do not lie in Africa. I mean, as I grew up, we were told that uh, we traveled from Judea, settled in Yemen for a few, quite a number of years. Then we crossed into Africa. And of course, that is why we're called Lemba. Although we're black Jews, but immediately we entered uh, Africa, then we're known as the Lemba. The Lemba is a group with a very strong cultural identity and practices unlike that of other groups around them. They maintain traditions which are significantly different from the traditions um, respected by most of the tribes in Central and, and, and Southern Africa. Tudor Parfit is a historian who has devoted his life to studying Judaizing groups all over the world. He's associated with the School for African and Oriental Studies in London, but lives in southern France. He's lived with the Lemba and has written several books about them. He's found that the Lemba have many practices and traditions that are more Israelite than African. We carried the beliefs and the practices from the past with us. And we, we never relinquished our practices even when we were in Africa. Professor Magda Leroux of UNISA has also lived among the Lemba and has written a book about them. She specifically researched the Lemba's Jewish Israelite-like customs and traditions. My main purpose was to investigate the Arab traditions and to compare them with the, with the um, Old Testament traditions and their, their customs. And the, um, it was fascinating to me to discover that their way of celebrating the new moon um, is even older than that of the, the Jewish people today. And it's interesting that the Lemba still have the, the pre-Talmudic way of celebrating the new moon. And that is traceable. So, Makdal believes that the Lemba have many practices that point to an ancient Israelite origin. That has been confirmed also through our practices. The fact that we don't partake of pork, the fact that we get circumcised at a very young age, and there would be rituals which would be held immediately after circumcision, which we continue to do now. But the slaughtering, what we do is we use kosher. And the way you cut the animal, you must cut it once so that immediately it actually dies. And of course it must bleed. And uh, bleeding has got to do with purification of the meat that you are going to eat. All of these customs closely resemble ancient Israelite practices and have made them distinct from other black groups. Throughout history, they've been commented upon by early Arab traders centuries ago and by more recent European explorers who came into contact with them. They're also known as Kruger's Jews because as a group they had a good relationship with President Paul Kruger. 
They've also been called the black Jews of Southern Africa. But how seriously can one take their oral traditions that claim they are descendants of ancient Israel who have journeyed from Jerusalem to the Yemen and then later on into Africa? I decided to take them seriously. You know, I mean, it's, it's difficult for our Western mind to, to believe those kind of things, you know, if you can't prove it. But even with proof, it's difficult for, for some people to believe. Nobody believed in their story. Certainly the local Jews did not believe in their story, and most of them still do not. Um, the whites among whom they lived didn't really believe in their story. While there was doubt about the Lemba's claims, serious research into their practices and traditions continued. In the 1980s, their music was analyzed by Professor Margaret Nabarro, and she concluded that at some stage they had contact with the Middle East. Magda Leroux studied their cultural practices intensely for many years and concluded that they showed remarkable similarities to ancient Israel. Further indications that the Lemba indeed had contact with the Yemen just like they had claimed was found by Tudor Parfit. On a trip to Yemen, he travelled with a local guide. And I told him about my research with the Lemba and how they claimed to be from a place called Sena. And he clapped his hands together and said, I know where that is. And he brought out an ancient map of the Hadramaut and indeed, right at the end of the wadi, there was this place called Sena. So next day, went with the Mukhtar in a jeep right to the end of the wadi. We found this place. There were still people living there. And then we discovered that a whole range of local tribal names were exactly the same as the tribal names of the Lemba. All of this was really intriguing, but far from proof of their claims. Then, cutting-edge science got involved. In the late 1990s, DNA analysis became available, and Professor Trevor Jenkins at WITS decided to do a DNA study on some Lemba men. They were astounded at the results. The patterns on over 50% of their Y chromosomes were much more closely related to Semitic people than they were to peoples of Africa, uh, in particular the Bantu-speaking peoples amongst whom they lived. The genetic findings are highly compatible with their claims that some of their ancestors, we would now say male ancestors, have indeed come from the Middle East. Within a few years, more sophisticated DNA analyses were done and Tudor Parfit and Marc de la Rue collected the DNA of 136 male Lembas. They were compared with a whole range of African uh, samples and of course a whole range of uh, Jewish uh, samples from different parts of the world. It was a very major, uh, major study. Again, the DNA was analysed, this time in London, by geneticist Neil Bradman. What we found specifically is that this Cohen modal haplotype, the type of chromosome that um, is found at high frequency, large numbers in Jewish priests, was present in a particular clan of the Lemba, the Buba, where it's at a frequency of a similar amount, about 50%. So what we're saying is that the genetic data actually supports the oral history, not what one might have thought would be more likely refutes the oral history. So the DNA analysis supported the idea that the Lemba were not only related to ancient Israelites, but that one of their clans is actually related to Israelite priests. We did a new collection last year where Jewish populations throughout the world were scrutinized using the whole genome. And what it shows is that they form part of the same cluster uh, of populations as the ancestors of the Jews. Its people came from the eastern end of the Mediterranean. These were the ancestors of the Lemba. These results have shown that the oral traditions of the Lemba were remarkably accurate, even down to the number of Lemba men who came into Southern Africa. Trevor Jenkins maintains 
that it's possible more or less to say um, how many of the Lemba arrived in Africa. So in other words, the founding group in Africa, according to him, is some seven or eight people. According to the oral tradition of the Lemba, there were 15 men in a boat, half were lost or went to the north, and the other half came into Zimbabwe or, and then down into South Africa eventually. So even the figures of the number of people in the boat that arrived in Africa um, are confirmed by, uh, by genetics. The accuracy of the Lemba stories also changed the way scholars look at the durability of oral traditions. While modern scholars in Europe, for instance, would reckon the Old Testament traditions it, that it couldn't last longer than about 100 years, o oral traditions in Africa can last more than a thousand years. But the Lemba not only have remarkably accurate traditions about their origins, they have another tradition, an intriguing tradition, about being the custodians of one of the most sought-after objects in history, the mysterious lost Ark of the Covenant. Modern science has supported the claims of an age-old oral tradition of a peculiar group of people in Southern Africa. They've claimed since time immemorial that they are descended from ancient Israel and that they journeyed first to a place called Sena in Yemen and then to Southern Africa where they settled. Remarkably, a number of DNA studies confirmed these oral traditions to a significant degree. But the Lemba have another intriguing and ancient oral tradition, a tradition about their involvement with the legendary Ark of the Covenant. Joe Rolinga grew up with this tradition. We travelled from Yemen into Africa, travelled from the north and came into southern Africa. And indeed, we carried the Ark, which was a, a holy drum, and I think it still remains holy now. The Lemba refer to this object they identify with the Ark as the Ngoma Lungundu, the drum of God. When Tudor Parfit lived with the Lemba in Zimbabwe, he also encountered stories about the Lemba and the Ark. After my first journey through Africa trying to determine the origins and the roots of the Lemba, I wrote my first book on them. And in it, I mentioned the traditions of the Ngon Lungundu, which comes from an Arabic source. And so in this particular case, a medieval traveler views a group of people traveling south and they are carrying a mighty drum and it is referred to by the name of Arahim. Now, Arahim could be Arabic, sounds like it might be Arabic for the old merciful, one of the names of God. It could also be a, a slight transformation of the Hebrew word for God, which is Elohim. El and R are often transposed, so it could be a different form of Elohim. Elohim is the Hebrew word used to refer to God, and Parfit says that if this is the case, men carrying the object clearly had to have some connection with ancient Israel. Makhda learned about the traditions of the Ngoma Lungundu from the Lemba themselves. And they told me, yes, we were the carriers of the Ngoma Lungundu. The priestly family of the Lemba, the Buba, the Kohanim, they were the carriers of the, of the Ngoma Lungundu and they carried it from the east coast of Africa southwards into Africa. Richard Wade is an astronomer and historian with a special interest in the Lemba. He also came across a tradition linking the Lemba and the Ngoma Lungundu with remarkable parallels to the stories about the Ark of the Covenant. As they go south, they meet different people who are hostile and they incorporate the people simply by beating the drum and the people die and they are killed. The drum would be used in the same way as the biblical Ark of the Covenant. 
Reports about this strange object have been circulating for many years and early European explorers in the area of southern Africa have also commented on it. The earliest story that I could get about the Ngoma Lungundu was recorded by uh, Fonsikart in 1952. He was a missionary who worked among the Lemba people in Zimbabwe and he actually um, observed the, the similarities between the Ark of the Covenant and the Ngoma Lungundu. That was in the 1950s. Uh, he really did know them, he lived with them, he spoke the language, he wrote a good deal uh, about their traditions. Some of the oral traditions of the other tribes in southern Africa also point to the Lemba being custodians of a very special object. At the Zata Ruins Museum, the curator Mpo Tsikosi says the Lemba and Venda ancestors met up in Central Africa and journeyed together to southern Africa. With them came the Ngomo Lungundu, and only the Lemba priests were allowed to carry it. So they were given instructions on how to treat this drum, because it was not supposed to touch the ground. If it touches the ground, um, great calamities will happen to, the, to that community, and they were not supposed to touch it with their bare hands. Even the Balemba who were chosen to carry it. If you touch it, you die instantly. So this drum had magic. So they were given the drum in order to protect them when they were moving from Central Africa to the south until they arrived here. So if they meet the enemies on the way, they will beat it once. They had a person called um, the high priest, Zomoladzim, who was responsible for carrying the messages from the gods to, to, the, to the people. So he was the one who was responsible for beating the drum if they meet the enemies on the way. So if he beat the drum once, the enemies will fall asleep. And then the other thing is that if they have drought when they are on the way, the high priest will beat it five times and then rain will start pouring at the same time. So an independent tradition from within the Venda people also confirms the existence of an object, perhaps drum-like, that was carried only by Lemba priests and which functioned much like the Ark of the Covenant. But how feasible are the stories about linking the Lemba and the Ark of the Covenant? Tudor Parfit has devoted much of his academic career researching the Lemba traditions and the possibility that they possessed the Ark. Over the years, he's developed a special relationship with the Lemba. I was commissioned, actually commissioned, by Mativa, who was then the indisputable head of the Lemba, to find the Ngoma. And so that became uh, an obsession. According to the Bible, the Ark was created by Moses and helped the Israelites through many wars. It eventually ended up in the Temple of Solomon. That's the last we read of the Ark in the Bible. But what did the Ark look like? There are actually two depictions of the Ark in the Bible. There are two quite different traditions in the Bible, one from the book of Exodus, which describes the Ark as being of a specific um, rectangular shape with a golden uh, roof, so to speak, um, with uh, cherubim uh, on it. And the other one is a simple wooden object um, made from the acacia tree that was carved and fashioned by Moses. This latter description is the oldest. In the desert, Moses was commanded to quickly fashion all by himself a holder for the broken tablets. It couldn't have involved sophisticated woodwork. Well, what you have is a, some kind of receptacle that you could put the stone tablets in, and that's it, made by Moses with a penknife. Now, that doesn't look very dissimilar from the Nagoma. Parfit is convinced that the description of the Ark as a well-manufactured, gold-plated object with the cherubim on top is how later generations depicted it. In the desert, Moses had hewn the Ark from an acacia tree. It's described as a simple wooden vessel. It wasn't that big. I would say it depends upon what um, length you give the cubit, but it's something like that. Um, long and something like about that high and about that wide, that sort of thing. It's a bit like a big suitcase. It had to be big enough to accommodate the, the tablets and it was only made of wood. 
Other sources, both biblical and extra-biblical, describe the ark as having some kind of function related to music, perhaps a drum or other percussion instrument. According to the biblical account, um, the ark was covered over um, with a, a leather that was um, taken from the back of a, of, a, of a sea mammal that's to be found on the shores of the Red Sea to this very day, something like a large seal. And, um, you know, when you've got a, a wooden object and it's covered over with a, <laughs> with, with a leather, you immediately start thinking of a drum. That's what a drum is. It seemed to me that there is some suggestion in the biblical text that the ark was actually a kind of musical instrument, as it was a kind of weapon. But we don't know. All we have is the text. Uh, but we know, for instance, that people danced in front of it, David did. We know that it formed part of a musical procession around the walls of Jericho. Um, it was preceded by trumpets. Well, perhaps it was some kind of a musical instrument. It was also uh, a weapon. And the Nagoma similarly was a musical instrument and it was also a weapon. Whatever the Ark looked like, it's believed to have vanished sometime in 6th century BCE, at the time of the Babylonian capture of Jerusalem. It's never mentioned in the Bible again. However, many believe that the Ark was spirited out of Jerusalem by the priests to protect it and to ensure that it didn't fall into the hands of the enemy. This is supported by the fact that the Babylonians, who were known to always carefully list the spoils of war, never mentioned that they found or captured the Ark in Jerusalem. If the Ark was spirited away, where could it have been taken to? There have been many theories about this and Tudor Parford has examined them all. A well-supported theory is that it's in a church in Aksum in Ethiopia. However, Parfit dismisses this possibility. A lot of Ethiopians believe that the Ark is there, but nobody has seen the Ark because nobody is allowed to see the Ark. Now, it just so happens that um, a certain Professor Edward Ullendorf, who was the professor of um, Ethiopian languages uh, at the University of London, and with whom I worked for some years, was a officer uh, in Ethiopia during the Second World War. And he was in Aksum, went to the church where the Ark is supposed to have been, the church which nobody is allowed to enter, but then with the dignity of a British Army uh, uniform on his back, he went in, he saw the Ark, and as one of the greatest authorities on Ethiopia in the 20th century declared unequivocally, this is not old, this has nothing to do with the Ark of the Covenant. Furthermore, the claims that the Ark is there in Ethiopia are also relatively recent. There is no evidence at all that it's in Ethiopia and all the work that's been done demonstrates without any doubt at all that in the medieval period there was no tradition of the Ark being in Ethiopia. Parfit also examined claims that the Ark had been taken to Elephantine in Egypt but couldn't find any solid evidence that it was ever taken there. At some stage, he was even summoned to Papua New Guinea where a tribe claimed they had seen the Ark on the bottom of a lagoon. And I thought, well, it would be interesting to go on to Papua New Guinea and go to the lagoon um, on the fly estuary where, this, uh, where the Ark of the Covenant apparently was sitting. But nothing was seen, nothing could be seen. And that was the end of that. And I kind of thought it was interesting that the tradition was believed in uh, with such passion. When none of the theories panned out, Tudor decided to follow the advice of a mentor who told him that in the quest for the Ark, he should follow the priests because they were always the custodians of the Ark. And DNA analysis had placed Israelite priests associated with an Ark-like object first in Yemen and then later the same group surfaced in southern Africa. As time went by, Parfoot became more and more convinced that the lost Ark could possibly be somewhere in southern Africa.
British historian Tudor Parfit has had a career-long fascination with the black Jews of Southern Africa and their claims to have brought an ark-like object with them into Africa centuries ago. He had examined textual, archaeological and medical evidence and was sure that their oral tradition about their association with the ark was not that far-fetched. In 2007, he got a call from Africa. I was given a tip from um, a white South African. He said he'd found the, the Nagoma, and given that I'd been looking for a good time, I was um, interested, to say the least. And so I got on a plane and went to South Africa. Machdel had summoned him after this source had made contact with her. When Parfit arrived, they went on an expedition into the South Pansberg Mountains to look for the Ark. Along with uh, Professor LaRue, uh, we went up into the vendor area to where this great Nagoma allegedly was. When they arrived at the village, they discovered that over the years, many replicas of the original Ngoma have been fashioned, usually to represent the Ngoma in ceremonies or to help safeguard it or simply to confuse enemies. After getting permission from the elders of the village, they were shown a number of drums in a hut. And unfortunately, it proved not to be uh, anything of either any antiquity or or any interest, so it was a, a wild goose chase. Parfit was disappointed because the drums they were shown were clearly fairly recent copies of the Ngoma. But Parfit wouldn't give up. He again scrutinized his sources and recalled a book by Harold von Sickard, the missionary who, in the 1940s, studied the Lemba intensely. In his book, he claimed to have found the Ngoma in a cave in the South Pansberg Mountains. He had found the Ngoma. Um, by following uh, oral traditions, he managed to follow it back to a particular cave in the Limpopo Valley, but apparently there was a, a skeleton lying next to the Nagoma, and local traditions seemed to support the idea that this was a priest that had died, presumably the last guardian of the Nagoma. He photographed it, Von Sickard writes that he took the Sangoma to the museum in Bulawayo, where he left it. Parfit followed up, but nobody at the museum knew anything about such a drum or ark or Ngoma. Nobody had the foggiest idea what I was talking about. And very, very kindly, they went through their stocks and into their storerooms and never came up with anything. Then, by pure coincidence, Parfit met a man who worked on the railways during the Rhodesian Civil War in the 1970s. He just told me a bizarre story about when he'd been driving this, this train from Bulawayo to the, the capital, that on one occasion they'd taken a shipment of artifacts, ethnographic artifacts. And he remembered because his, um, his friend had stolen a mask. It was round about Christmas time. He stole the mask, gave it to his wife. And it just occurred to me that the Nagoma might have been in that shipment or in a similar shipment. This was during the Civil War. They were trying to take the valuable stuff and put it in a safe place. So then, Parfit scoured the museums in Harare and found that the Zimbabwe Museum of Human Sciences had a large collection of undocumented drums. Very kindly, they opened up the, uh, the, the part that the public is never allowed into, where they keep uh, old stock, which is not ever exhibited. And we went in, and in the second alcove, between, uh, on one side of the corridor, um, I saw uh, what I thought was the Nagoma. It looked very similar. And some of the museum staff um, carried it out and when I saw it in the light, I realized that this was it. Then something bizarre happened. And as I was looking at it and thinking about these things, I saw that there was a great pool of blood covering the floor underneath it. And then I thought it was the African guy that was carrying it. And indeed, it turned out to be that he'd cut his hand on the, the wood of the Nagoma but in an incredibly uh, deep and savage way, we had to take him to the hospital. 
Parfit was convinced that he had found the fabled Ngomalungundu, the Ark of the Covenant. It was quite a moment for him. In a way, the whole kind of uh, episode turned into a sort of piece of magic realism. Because on the one hand, I'm a complete rationalist, but on the other hand, I knew that this object, over time, had had all kinds of magical powers, or had been thought to have such powers. His discovery made world headlines. Several documentary films were produced by the BBC and the Discovery Channel, and Parfit published a book about his find. It was followed by an exhibition of the Ngoma in Harare. It has become so revered by various groups that it has spawned new religious movements all over Southern Africa. So then the, uh, a new chapter opens at that point in the history of the Ngoma, where new religions are formed, um, where important uh, political figures start playing a role, um, including the president of, uh, of a state. It has become an object of massive importance uh, within Zimbabwe, uh, for good reasons and for bad. The Ngoma Parfit discovered in the museum in Harare has unfortunately become a complex issue with many claims to it. It's venerated by too many people, different people, and everybody wants it for themselves. So the Lemba want it and the Vendor want it, and various other tribes um, within uh, the context of, uh, of uh, Zimbabwe want it for themselves, and the government wants it for itself, and Mugabe wants it for himself, the museum wants it and so on. So it's, um, it's, all very, uh, it's, it's all very complicated, and. One obviously is very afraid that um, some harm will come to the Nagoma, and uh, clearly it should be in a museum. But the euphoria of finding the Ngoma was short-lived. There were two major setbacks. First, Parfit discovered that the Ngoma was not as old as he had thought. He had it carbon dated. Obviously, we were very interested to see how old this object was. And we had it um, carbon dated in the uh, Department of Archaeology at uh, Oxford University. And they came up with, um, with a date, um, plus or minus 1300. Now, that's not as old as the Ark of the Covenant, but it's, um, it's pretty damned old. And indeed, um, as far as I know, it's the oldest wooden object in, in sub-Saharan Africa. If this was a 13th century object, it was perhaps a replica of a much older original, as it was customary among the Lemba and Venda to make replicas of the Ngoma to protect it and to confuse enemies. However, with this object, Parfit still believed he had come closer to the fabled Ark of the Covenant than any other before him. The second setback was that the newly found Ngoma vanished again. Certainly on the street, the word has it that uh... Mr. Mugabe is keeping the object, the Ark, the Ngoma, in his country property. Um, and he's a very su superstitious man. Uh, he's using it um, to keep himself in power, to keep himself alive. That's what people say. And it was first taken away from the uh, museum by uh, soldiers, uh, armed soldiers, who came there at 3 o'clock in the morning. And since then, nobody has uh, seen it as far as I'm aware. So the object Parfit found was indeed very old, but it was definitely not ancient and not dating back to ancient Israel. Nevertheless, Parfit was satisfied that he had come as close to the lost Ark of the Covenant as humanly possible, and that his quest has been satisfied. But there still might be a twist in the tale. New claims have now emerged that a much older ark, perhaps one dating to the time of Solomon, has been discovered in South Africa. The claim of British researcher Tudor Parfit that he has traced the lost Ark of the Covenant which the Lemba brought into Africa has attracted world attention. Members of the Lemba, including Judge Joe Rowlinger, believe that Parfit had been on the right track. I think Parfit's research has led us to discovering the Ark 
and we're really very, very proud of the work that he has done. Tudor Parford had fulfilled the promise he had made to the Lemba many years ago and had indeed managed to trace a 13th century copy of the Ngoma to Harare. However, archaeologist Richard Wade now claims that he has found a much older artifact, perhaps dating back millennia, in a cave in the Sotpansberg Mountains, protected by special guardians. He got a clue to the existence of this in a 1950s article published by Peter van Heerden. He wrote that he was taken by this man, Ntangeni Nechindulu, to a cave which is the gravesite of the legendary vendor leader Dabanika. In a cave nearby, Van Heerden was shown the original Ngoma Lungundu. In the cave, there were also two more recently made replica drums. This is a photograph of the replicas he was shown. Richard managed to trace Van Heerden and through him he found the grandson of the Guardian. The article by Van Heerden was first published in Afrikaans and didn't attract much attention. However, Richard took Van Heerden's article seriously. That thing does exist. and. I later, by accident, found the actual place. Hidden away in this particular place is, is the most sacred object uh, in South Africa. I became revered by the people who guard those places, and they requested that I please reveal this. That was when Richard gave Magdal a call, and she got Parfit to come to South Africa to find the Ark. Richard says when he, Magdal and Parford went to look for this Ngoma, they indeed went to the right spot. However, the guardians were wary of Parford, so they showed him much younger drums to stop him from investigating further. Parford was indeed disappointed and called the trip a wild goose chase. He then went on and discovered the 13th century Ngoma in Harare. Shortly after Parfit abandoned the search, Richard returned to the gravekeeper's village and said he was taken up into this mountain by the gravekeeper. He claims that this cave is the final resting place of the legendary vendor leader Dambanyika and that the lost ark, the real Ngoma, is in this cave. It's in an area sacred to the vendor people. In order to go to this zone, I need to first always ask permission from the king of the Venda people, who are, in a way, descendants of those original communities. And they are the progenitors of the Venda people, yes. Richard received permission and was taken up the mountain to this cave by the current gravekeeper. Uh, several uh, gravekeepers have gone through uh, guarding this object, and uh, there are other relics in this cave. Apart from the leopards and the sacred leopard that lives there with its little uh, kittens, uh, which I discovered, it is a very, very sacred zone. The gravekeeper himself may not look at the cave and scrapes his face on the rocks and bleeds as he scrapes his way 50 to 100 meters coming close to the cave. So I was given a tremendous honor and privilege. Apparently, the guardians of the Ark continued the practice of making replicas of the original and usually placed them in or near the cave. This is what Peter van Heerden photographed in the 50s, and the older 13th century copy eventually made its way to the museum in Harare. And it would appear uh, that this particular drum that von Sikar took was inside the cave. However, there are the remains of the original Ngoma Lungundu in the cave. And you can see them. And above them are two new drums which were produced uh, much later than the time when the drum was placed in the cave. So when those drums are broken, the gravekeeper will make new ones. So, according to Richard, the original Ngoma, perhaps even the lost Ark of the Covenant, is still in that very same cave in the mountains. It's never been removed. Richard says he has seen the remains of this original Ark. The drum that lies in the cave, to my knowledge, the one that is destroyed underneath the present drums, uh, that is possibly a piece of the original and uh, it doesn't quite look like a drum.
So what does it look like? More rectangular. But I can't tell you too much. Again, Richard was pressurized to reveal more and he was adamant that he had seen the Ark. The actual Ngoma Lungundu is seemingly the closest contender at this point in time to the Ark mythology. And yes, it does exist in the cave and it's real. And it is very revered and it is very sacred. Uh, so, I have seen it, yes, in its present state. And I have seen the new ones. And uh, you can see it too. Richard promised that he would reveal a photograph that he had taken of this object, but so far he has not complied with the request. But how feasible is it that a wooden object would even last nearly 2,500 years? One might ask how long wood could survive. Now, we know that in Egypt um, there are boats or the remains of boats that are about 5,000 years old. So it's perfectly possible for wood to survive for very, very long periods. In the case of the acacia tree, and it is that from that that the ark was made according to the biblical account, it's an incredibly hard wood, and in the right circumstances, it could survive for ever. So it is possible for a wooden object to survive thousands of years. Richard is adamant that the object he saw in the cave is ancient, and that it could be the original Ngoma. Has Richard Wade perhaps discovered the lost Ark of the Covenant? The fabled Ark of the Covenant was last mentioned in the Bible in conjunction with the reign of King Solomon 2,500 years ago. Then it vanished from history. Over the centuries, many legends and stories about its whereabouts arose. Some traditions say that the Ark was taken to Arabia, Egypt or Ethiopia. Others connect this to a Southern African tribe called the Lemba. Essentially the story is this, the Lemba story is this. We brought this object from the north, from Arabia, from Senna, and we brought it to Africa. The people who brought it were connected with the clan of the Buba. The clan of the Buba have got the same ancestor as Jewish priests. So it really did look as if there was some uh, plausible connection with the Old Testament story. It wasn't simply a question of this ignorant black tribe having absorbed uh, stories that were fed them by the missionaries. It looked like it was something very much more uh, authentic. The traditions further say the Lemba brought the Ark with them to Southern Africa, but at some stage lost custody of it to another group closely related to the vendor. This group became its custodians and still has it hidden in a cave somewhere in the Sotpansberg Mountains. Some researchers like Tudor Parfit believe that in the 1940s, the oldest remaining copy of it was found in the cave by a white missionary and taken to Zimbabwe, where Parfit eventually discovered it. Richard Wade believes that since it was only a replica, the real Ngoma Lungundu, the real Ark of the Covenant, is still in a cave in South Africa. So there is a possibility, you know, when you come here to the middle of Africa and you suddenly find uh, the DNA that belongs somewhere else, say in the middle of the Middle East, uh, you've got to really start listening to their stories. And if their stories say, yes, we've brought with us some remarkable object uh, and we can prove it, then you should take note. Uh, yes, so archaeology, astronomy and interdisciplinary uh, studies, a little DNA and so on, you eventually find, yes, this is not something that is just totally uh, a miss of the truth. Whether it is the Ark of the Covenant or not is, of course, the question. Uh, it is, uh, I believe, part of the mythology of the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, one needs to really physically go and have a proper look. 
However, Richard is very reluctant to reveal the exact location of the cave and to bring this legendary object to light. He says it would be to the detriment of the local community. Archaeologically speaking, people will become fortune hunters. You will have problems. It is a very sacred zone. And uh, it is protected by a lot of people. But um, it will not be very nice if many helicopters and aeroplanes start infiltrating the airspace for a start. You know, just to open this sacred object uh, because it's interesting, it, uh, it might revitalize a certain community. But I think that community should rather be the protectors of this great treasure and um, one should uh, revere to a certain extent identify and publish but not encroach and destroy. Furthermore, Richard says that in addition to the Ngoma in the cave, there's also a lost city in that area that must also be protected. It's even vaguely visible on Google Earth images. There is a city there which seems to precede Great Zimbabwe and may be as big as three kilometers in extent and walling. Um, it, is, it, is, uh, it is a remarkable building. It, uh, the walls are, are very, very thick. Uh, they are two meters uh, wide and some of them are very high, up to not as high as Great Zimbabwe, 10 meters, but uh, up to four or five meters, I think, was the, the highest. Well, I couldn't get to see the rest. It's, it's under tremendous uh, uh, vegetation and so you, it's difficult to get there. But um, it is a sacred zone and I think, you know, it should stay sacred it was rather a, a sad thing when Mapungupwe became revealed. Uh, everything was destroyed for science. Whether or not Richard Wade is correct in refusing to reveal the exact location of where he believes a very ancient object, perhaps even the Ark of the Covenant, is located, only time will tell. But what is certain is that the Ark of the Covenant and the many myths and legends associated with it will continue to fascinate generations to come. The search for the lost Ark is not over yet.